the concept of mark to market and where did this story originate let's talk about how bearings bank and its fabulous collapse way back in 1992 resulted in a very critical system adopted by investment banks then and now hedge funds mutual funds and all commercial banks in the concept of marking to market their outstanding portfolio Hello everybody I'm learning partner Sushila Hariharan and if you're interested in a career in investment banking OTC derivatives hedge fund accounting and and uh, trade life cycle do subscribe to my YouTube channel where we provide content rich research focused videos on these topics The year was 1992 when one of the biggest banks the oldest banks and the Queen's Bank the Barings Bank collapsed thanks to a rogue trader called Nick Leeson. Nick Leeson was one of the star traders of Barings Bank first in their London offices and because he was so super successful in the London markets he was designated and transferred to then the emerging most exciting market in the world the tiger economies the asian economies were then called the tiger economies because they were all revolutionizing their economic fundamentals Barings Bank saw an opportunity for Nick Leeson to go there and make millions of pounds for the bank Nick Leeson at first was very very successful in this division as a trader in the FX market and in the equity markets he dealt aggressively and without keeping any take profits or stop losses he made tons of profits for the bank So how did he operate? He traded on a very unique trading opportunity which existed then called as an arbitrage opportunity. So arbitrage as we know is the ability to buy low in a particular market and sell the same asset at a higher price in a different market in a very short period of time thus making a huge amount of profit. Right? arbitrage opportunity existed in those days simply because of time lag because of not so evolved information technology systems which prevented trading up trading and arbitrage opportunities on the same asset in different markets so he traded in an arbitrage manner on what uh, on what instruments on the uh, futures market okay so he had a very uh, drive through in the nikkei futures nikkei is n i k k e i the official index of the tokyo stock exchange like how we have sensex on the bsc we have s and p 500 for the united states markets we have the nasdaq composite index in the united states markets and we have nifty 50 in the indian markets the leading barometer for the japanese markets is the nikkei 225 okay comprising as the name suggests 225 stocks of the japanese stock market as prioritized according to their market capitalization he traded on these index futures okay way back in 1992 all right today we are all going gaga over uh, nifty 50 and bnf etc but way back in 1992 he traded in index futures g- grappling with the arbitrage opportunity that existed between the osaka stock exchange pricing and the singapore markets that's the simex markets he made a lot of profits initially and because of the kind of profits that he made the london offices of barings bank rewarded him with money they gave him a higher increment in the salary they gave him a fabulous bonus because he showed what uh, trading profits could be made in a relatively new market in a relatively new geographic zone propelled by his drive to make more profits he then started to take on bigger bets without taking any hedging position he entered into large value contracts with counterparties in different countries trading on just this one single contract that is the nikkei 225 futures and then the collapse came in the japanese markets unfortunately because of a very powerful earthquake that took place and when this earthquake shattered the markets and the markets collapsed 
Nick Leeson started making losses. So here was a very cunning operator. What he did was every time there were profits, he showed the profits to the London offices and the picture was looking so beautiful, so rosy, always pink in the health of everything, right? And when the markets collapsed and when the market started crashing, he continued to hold on to these positions rather than exiting these positions. But he never showed these losses to the London offices. Instead, he went away, he put away all the loss-making trades into a suspense account. Suspense account, as we know, is an account wherein the fund accounting team or the accounting team doesn't recognize the underlying transactions and therefore the suspense account has to not be in suspense for a very long duration of time. It has to be ratified. It has to be corrected. We have to find out what are the underlying transactions leading to that suspense account. The London offices ignored this. They kept pumping in capital into Bearings Bank and therefore Nick Leeson kept taking in more and more prof more and more high value transactions in Nikkei futures. Unfortunately, the market didn't turn around very quickly and the losses touched a billion pounds. The counterparties to the trade now started demanding collateral. The London offices didn't know about this collateral call because Nick Leeson never showed them this collateral call. And when the London offices started ask, when the counterparty started asking Bearings for collateral, for continuing to fund the lost making position, he had no choice but to put his hands up in the air and say, sorry, there were no profits. They were all actually losses. This single rogue trader brought down a 300-year-old bank because of his rogue trades. What would have happened if the London offices didn't ignore? What would have happened if collateral was continuously being put in to fund the trading position? There would have been transparency in the trade. There would have been transparency in the uh, operations. But Nick Leeson would not have got his fabulous bonuses. He would not have got those promotions. He would not have got those increments. And therefore, the bank itself, this collapse of the bank, resulted into a very large, systemic, worldwide, literally worldwide acceptance of mark to market and collateral management across banks. Very soon after this transaction took place, after, after this bank collapsed, the bank became bankrupt and the bank collapsed, global banks realized the stupidity and the idiocy of having to, you know, a single trader managing the trading as well as the back office. And banks then started splitting their operations into a three-way process. That's the front office division, the middle office that checks the front office and finally the back office that does the reconciliation. So much so, there cannot be a situation where there is not enough collateral. The trades nowadays automatically get settled if collateral is not matched up and there are a whole lot of delivery procedures for that. But because of the bankruptcy of one bank caused by one rogue trader, in their operations of literally uh, index futures. The, ba the banks today worldwide have adopted principles of MTM, that's mark to market, which has to be done every day on all outstanding positions of the bank, especially because it must reflect to the trader whether they will be able to take in additional positions in the bank in, in a particular asset class or not. This one incident resulted into banks then thinking about how can we avoid these mistakes? How can we prevent this thing from occurring again? Wherein the front office dealer is trading from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. and from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. he's sitting and doing the back office settlements so much so that he is uncontrollable. He is like an elephant that has gone berserk right because they do not want to show their losses they keep transferring into suspense account and the losses in the account had resulted into a billion 
pound loss. In today's day and age, billion pounds is a lot of money. Way back, you know, 30 years ago, it was even larger amount of money for uh, individual traders, rogue trades to get, you know, to just be completely ignored by the bank. Thus, the operation of MTM, marking to market, is now a mandatory requirement by not just SEBI in India, it's also by FCA in the UK and by all regulators across the world. And in the case of banking, RBI also mandates that all outstanding foreign exchange positions as well as bond book has to be marked to market on a daily basis. The concepts of collateral management thereafter evolved from this so that mark to market resulted into having a adequate funding for your trading position. If adequate funding is not there, then the positions are automatically squared off. So this collapse of the Barings Bank has created a concept which many banks nowadays follow, I have to follow because of regulations and have thus prevented rogue traders traders who have decided to trade against the principles of you know controlled environment tradings and thus the banks are today in a much healthier position because they are not allowed to trade recklessly thank you so much